Good morning, and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I'm this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, as well as making his debut as a worship associate, Chris Slon. We also have technical support from communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and Zoom greeter, Mary Jo Ebert. Birmingham Unitarian Church is a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Even in our virtual format, we are a thriving religious community with a place for everyone. All people of goodwill are welcome here. Social justice is an essential component of our lives. We are a capital W welcoming congregation and a green sanctuary congregation. Our social justice work this year is focused on civic engagement, racial inequality, economic inequality, and environmental justice. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour, especially if you are worshiping with us for the first time today. We hope that you'll stay after the service and get to know us. We have three announcements this morning. All of them are about something that's happening today. Today is the last day to order poinsettias to support our religious education program. You can order those by clicking on the order poinsettias button on our website. Pickup will be on Saturday, December the 12th next week between 10 a.m. and noon in the parking lot. This year you can order poinsettias for yourself or as a gift for a fellow BUCer. If you choose to send them as a gift, it will be anonymous and we will choose the recipient. You can submit your payment online by Venmo or by check, but all of those orders are due today. Also today is the deadline for adopt a family. If you are planning to adopt a family or want to donate to the program in general, today is the last day for that. There are still 23 kids who have not been adopted. Help brighten their holidays by going to the BUC website and use the orange Adopt a Family button. If you have any troubles with that or any questions, please contact Jane O'Neill. And finally, also today, our high school youth group, Goosh, will meet in the courtyard at 1 p.m. to lead a special bonus worship service. Participating youth can check Discord for all of the details. Everyone is welcome to join the service, which will also be on Zoom, but using a different link than the one you use to join this service. And that link can be found on the BUC meeting calendar. Again, that's today at one, and it's a very special opportunity. I, for one, can't wait to see what they came up with. Thanks for joining us this morning or whenever you are watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit, and it is good to be together again. And with that, our service will begin. This morning's prelude uh, had, needs no introduction, and I hope you enjoy how I've spent uh, the last couple days with this 18th century carol.
we are truly blessed to be a part of a free religious movement that allows us to take some of the best things from the past and make them modern for today. We light our chalice this morning from our separate homes, but we are joined with a multitude of Unitarian Universalists in doing so. We are called this morning to be present to the world around us in all of its complexity and beauty. As we wait for the joys of tomorrow, let us find something to celebrate today. Our first hymn this morning is Golden Breaks the Dawn, number 353. this morning are from Reverend Erica Hewitt. This is the season of endings and beginnings, when the small signs of dawn pierce through the night and something new is born. But first comes the waiting. First comes the lessons of endings and beginnings. The presence of life, the sheltering spirit of love, grieves with those sweeping up the debris of loss, waits with those who restlessly reach out for change grants us courage in the night to guard each other's dreams for this holy, wondrous universe. Grant us, O oh universe unfolding in mystery, a sense of your timing. May we loosen our grip on that which doesn't serve us, leaving behind that, that which we have outworn and outgrown. Teach us the lessons of beginnings. Remind us that such waitings and endings may be a starting place, a planting of seeds, which bring to birth what is ready to be born, something right and just and different, a new song, a deeper relationship, a fuller love in the fullness of time. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offering serves as an ongoing reminder of that mission. Sharing in this weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and our high purpose. So let there be an offering in support of this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website, Venmo, or a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude for each other. This morning's offertory was composed in 1944 
by Johnny Mercer. One, a two, a one, two, three, four. You got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and latch on to the affirmative. Don't mess with Mr. In Between. You got to get joy up to the maximum, bring gloom down to the minimum, and have faith or pandemonium's liable to walk upon the scene. To illustrate my last remark, Joan, I am the well, Noah in the ark. What did they do just when everything looked so dark? Oh, well, you got to to the time in our service that we've set aside for centering through prayer, meditation, and reflection. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. We are also concerned about the cuts in contract workers at Ford and the ongoing uncertainty of the job market in our area. There are things that weigh on us this morning and things for which we are grateful. And we bring them together in the fullness of life to share as a religious community together. I invite you now to move forward with me into the spirit of prayer and centering. Spirit of love and life, we come now into a season that is shared with expectation and waiting and also a frenzied rush. During this time, may we be given the wisdom to slow down and experience that which is happening around us the things that are moments of joy and the things that are moments of sorrow. May we bring those here and offer them on the altar of this community. May we, through our joys and sorrows that we share with one another and in this greater world, find a deeper understanding of ourselves and a deeper knowledge of what it is to be alive, what it is to be a part of this time and this place. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Find, hold, let the stillness carry me. Find, hold, let the silence carry me. In the spirit, by the spirit, with the spirit giving power, I will find true harmony. tried to make sense of the world lately, I keep hearing, once one dismisses 
the rest of all possible worlds. One finds that this is the best of all possible worlds. That echoes in an improbable region of my brain where enlightenment philosophy intersects with Broadway show tunes. You see, that line is from a number in Leonard Bernstein's Candide, which is a musical restatement of Voltaire's satire of an argument by Leibniz. Now, those are some pretty heavy names to drop on a Sunday morning, I know, but I think you'll find it is just enough to balance against the weight of the world. But let me explain. I'll begin with Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz, a great thinker of the Enlightenment who espoused the idea of optimism. This is not the glass half full optimism we know today. This optimism is based on a specific idea that this is the best of all possible worlds, an idea arrived at through the rigorous methods of rationalism. Leibniz, a rationalist, framed the proof this way. He starts with three axioms, presumably accepted truths that need no proof. One, God is the only perfect being. Two, God is good. Three, God created the world. From this foundation, Leibniz reasons that the world cannot be perfect since only God can be perfect. If the world is not perfect, it could be any of a number of possible imperfect worlds. Since God is good, God created that world which has the least amount of suffering. Therefore, this is the best of all possible worlds. From this perspective, everything that happens, even evil, is ultimately for the best. As a trained engineer, I find the argument logical, but not very useful. As a born again agnostic, I find the axioms contrived and less than universally accepted, even back then. As a self-professed poet, I find the conclusion barren and wholly unsatisfactory. Taken altogether, I guess I'm not an optimist, but I'm in good company. Voltaire, who lived a little after Leibniz, found this argument flawed and dangerous. Flawed because it ignores the evil humans create in the world and dangerous because it encourages passivity toward improving the world. Voltaire wrote a satirical novel in response to Leibniz's argument, wherein the title character Candide is taught Leibnizian optimism as a youth, then experiences a tragic world filled with political unrest, social injustice, brutal violence, natural disasters and plagues, broken faith and death. If you've been paying attention to the news for the last few months or years, you might find the storyline familiar. Finally, Candide in exhaustion and despair abandons optimism, but Candide finds a better perspective. In the end, he confronts his childhood tutor declaring that noble thought has its place, but true meaning lies in just living day to day. The only truly meaningful act is to do our best in our daily tasks, bake our bread, chop our wood, build our home, make our garden grow. 200 years after Voltaire, Leonard Bernstein told Candide's story in music. The show was never really successful on the stage, but there are several wonderful recordings of it. When I am overwhelmed by the effort of trying to make sense of the world, I listen to the finale of Bernstein's Candide, Make Our Garden Grow. The words that the meaning of life is found in the satisfaction of our daily tasks done well, never fail to bring a tear and a fresh perspective to my eye. The piece builds gradually to the last verse when the orchestra drops out and the entire cast and chorus in lush harmony sing we're neither pure nor wise nor good. We'll do the best we know. We'll build our house and chop our wood and make our garden grow and make our garden grow. This holiday season, don't spend too much time news reading, Twitter following, doom scrolling, trying to make sense out of nonsense. Bake your bread, chop your wood, maybe listen to some Bernstein. And even in this, the bleak midwinter, make your garden grow. Thank you, Chris. I'm excited about all the gifts that Chris is going to bring to our worship associate program and already has. 
So I, I keep seeing this commercial with a family setting up a Christmas tree and a teenage girl who just cannot get into it. The commercial opens and the dad says something like, this is a year to remember. And she rolls her eyes as only a teenage girl can. And so he adds, or maybe to forget. And it goes on from there with a the younger sister putting ornaments on the tree and the older girl criticizing her. She finally reaches a breaking point and she says, they may as well cancel Christmas this year. They canceled everything else. And the little sister is disheartened. She leaves the room. The dad motions for the older sister to go after her and she stands outside of the younger kid's bedroom and sings a Christmas song and an affirmation of the younger's Christmas spirit and perhaps even an attempt to recover her own. Maybe you've seen this commercial too. It's a Meyer commercial and every time that thing comes on, I tear up a little. I mean, we're not talking about a work of cinematic glory here, it's Meyer. This is an ad that plays on the deep well of emotion that we all have for a year to remember or perhaps forget. One of my all-time favorite Southern sayings, Southern sayings is a phrase used when something is taking too long. We say it's slow as Christmas. That coffee maker is slow as Christmas. This line is slow as Christmas. Maybe sometimes we might say a person is slow as Christmas. We tend to spend a whole year waiting for Christmas and it always seems to pass slowly. We anticipate it the whole year long. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we have a positive relationship with Christmas or the month of December. For a lot of us, waiting for Christmas is an experience of slow, looming dread rather than excitement. The American culture of Christmas is at once aggressively joyful and casually brutal. Christmas messaging tells us that we don't make enough money to properly show our love, or perhaps we don't have enough friends and family to love, or maybe they're not the right friends and family to make that perfect holiday greeting card or maybe we don't celebrate Christmas and it's basically inescapable. And we're expected to be of good cheer through the whole thing. Whether our relationship with the holiday is positive or negative or deeply ambivalent, Christmas has been particularly slow this year. And now that it's finally here, not even Christmas is living up to the impossibly high standards of Christmas. In any season, most of our lives are spent living in the future or in the past. And the weeks leading up to Christmas have the dubious honor of doing both. We dream of next year when all our troubles will be out of sight. We believe in a misty-eyed version of the future when war and poverty will end but it'll only happen if we want it badly enough today. If we wish for it with all our might, we somehow will end war and poverty. And at the same time, we are immersed in a saccharine nostalgia for a time that never was when things were simple and everyone was a Norman Rockwell painting. And that, that was the time of peace and prosperity when war and poverty lived in far off lands and it had nothing to do with us. Christmas messages tell us that there is a best possible world and it has already happened and or it is yet to come, but it is not now. We are barraged with songs and stories of a best possible world that is the property of the past or of the future. And these songs and stories are particularly loud in a year that we don't really want to look too closely at anyway. And this year, more than ever, we want that compulsory time travel. In just a few weeks, we get to say good riddance to a year that we'll always remember and can't wait to forget. I'm not going to go over the litany of things that happened this year, we all know, there were things that happened at every level of our lives that we were just not prepared to deal with. 
whether or not there is a best possible world, this year was the worst and we are ready to move on. I've heard stories from many of you about trying to suffocate 2020 in garlands and bright red bows. I'm in this camp too. I have sunk hours into finding the perfect living spruce and fir wreath with lights and pine cones and holly berries. And I feel great about that choice. I think that we all have permission to do what we need to do so that we can close this year on an upswing. And since Christmas is not going to be canceled, we might as well try to beat it at its own game. This year, we're going to drag Christmas through Christmas rather than getting drugged by it. Although we're ready to put this year behind us, let's not get lost in an escapist fantasy. There is no past world because it lives in memory, which is imperfect. And there is no future world because we have no control over the future. Therefore, there is only the present, which makes this actually the best possible world, I would argue. And God willing, there will never be another year like this. And as it draws to an end, my hope is for us to be awake to this spiritual moment, to feel those feelings difficult as they might be. Personally, I don't want to be in my 60s and have a young person ask me what it was like to live through 2020 and my only response to be, well, in March, I closed my eyes and I put my fingers in my ears and then it was December and I bought a whole bunch of Christmas lights. There is no reason to put off celebration for a better time. And there is no reason to skip celebrating whatever it is that we celebrate because there was some better time. We need celebration and joy now more than ever in whatever format that takes for us. We need a more honest celebration than we've come to expect of the great American Christmas racket. We need to celebrate the joy that lives right here and now because this is all that exists. And that joy, that celebration is what gives meaning to a year that might otherwise be pretty bleak and empty. Not by wishing ourselves into a different reality, but by transmuting difficulty into something worth celebrating. That is how we can round up a year that could have been better. We can find the spirit of joy as we make a celebration of the world exactly as it is today, because it is literally the only world that exists and therefore it has to be the best of all possible worlds. Let's do that. I think we can. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Amen. Our last hymn today is hymn number 226, People Look East. Sun and moon together 
people the keys can sing today. Love the star is on the way. And now we go out into this world that is all of the things at once, perfect and beautiful and broken and difficult and make joy and celebration here in the midst of really all that is. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.